all aboard and welcome to Spy Hearts Podcast, where your hosts go deep undercover into the world of spy movies to decipher which films make the knock list. But remember, this information is strictly for your ears only. I am Agent Scott. And I'm Cam the Provocateur. And Scott, I don't know if you've heard, but I'm hot stuff on birds. I, I, uh, I have heard, and I've heard your official title is quite a mouthful. <laughs> tweet, tweet. <laughs> Cuckoo. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right, well, that's the ornithologist jokes out the way, folks. Uh, yeah, we started well. Mm, that's a mouthful. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Uh, well, Cam, let's punch our ticket. We're going mad on trains at the moment. I don't know if you've noticed a the theme recently, folks. It was completely unintentional, but what are we talking about this week? Yes, we are talking about 1948's Sleeping Car to Trieste, which I guess we should have assumed was a train movie, given that it's called Sleeping Car. Yeah, I, I mean, I've I've been on a sleeping car before, so I probably should have got that. For some reason, I had the name of this movie wrong in my head for like a couple weeks, and I was referring to it as Night Train to Trieste. See, I, I keep singing uh, Midnight Train to Georgia when I think about this song for some reason. Uh, maybe it's that. Maybe that's how it's getting connected for you. Okay. Maybe. Maybe. I, I'm going to assume that somewhere, because we have our, our master list of all the spy movies that we'll be tackling on the show. Mm-hmm. I'm pretty sure there's one called Night Train something something that I've added somewhere along the road, and I'm just completely mixed up. Night Train something something. I mean, that's why we don't put you in charge of naming films. Yeah, that's true. Uh, we do have one called Night Train to Munich. There we go. Yeah, yeah, okay. Which is uh, next week on the show, <laughs> funnily <laughs> enough, folks. <laughs> well, uh, I suppose let's talk about the film. Uh, for those who haven't heard of it, and that's uh, probably quite a few of you, here is your letterbox.com synopsis. And I have a feeling this was copied off the front of a DVD box. Ooh. Sleeping Car to Trieste. A thousand miles of thrills, drama, and excitement. Spies pursue a stolen diary aboard the Orient Express. (laughs) Scene. (laughs) I mean, that's kind of... That is the movie. Like, if you were to ask me to expand on that, eh, uh, I don't know if there's really that much you can say. Well, I suppose it's, it's a question about how to structure a synopsis yeah because like you you look at some of these people who write these things and it's war and peace yeah and it really is overkill you don't need to spell everything out but what is the point of a synopsis it's it's to like give you know give you a taste right Mm -hmm. something to give you all of the whole like it's, it's 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 an encapsulation of the plot not the story right yeah and this movie that is the plot there is a Top secret diary with information that could start a war. Uh, it is lost on a train. Uh, two spies are searching for it, and then it's all about the little, the little lives going on. You know, kind of this ecosystem of the train. There's various sets of two characters that have romantic relationships or friendships and all that sort of thing, and how the little dramas tie into the larger spy story. It's well, it's an interesting one. I do want to talk about it, but I'm uh, I'm going to guess you've never seen it before. No, I had never ridden the sleeping car, no. Oh, that's what I hear. <laughs> <laughs> Word around the carriage is. <laughs> <laughs> now, clearly, I hadn't either, despite being quite a train fan. Uh, so I guess we'll jump straight to how it got made, because we have no sort of personal backstory with a 1940s film. Well, it's funny, because like in na- a lot of 1940s films they are tied in some way to things, if I haven't seen them, that I'm at least familiar with. Maybe like a star or a director or something. Like, this is a British film with a cast that I was largely unfamiliar with. So Mm -hmm. I didn't have any connectivity. Like, some of them, it's like, I can go, oh, of course, you know, this director went on and did this, this, and this. Like, when we did Five Fingers, it was directed by Joseph L. Mankiewicz. Mm -hmm. Well, I could definitely tie that to a lot of his other work I've seen. In this case, ugh. Not so much to work with. That's uh, what you have to deal with me every week, I suppose. <laughs> a constant work in progress. Yeah. So yeah. the kind of the making of of this movie, this was actually a remake. This movie was a uh, a remake of 1932's Rome Express, which 
I initially, when I stumbled across this information, I was like, oh, crap. Should we have been tackling Rome Express first? Because mm. uh, typically we like to do that when there's like an original remake situation. But Rome Express was actually built around a missing painting. There were no spies. And it was uh, pretty much kind of the same kind of story. A little bit darker, a little more gritty. Um, but uh, not spy driven. And it did star, though, Conrad Veidt. Our friend and, uh, you know, who we've seen a few times on Spy Our Arts. personal friend. Personal friend, Conrad Veidt. Good old Connie. Yeah. Good lad. <laughs> yeah, we have a seance every now and again and communicate with him. He's doing great, by the way. Um, Loves it up there. Loves it. He's doing great, everyone. He thanks you for your well wishes. Yeah. Um. Well, I. It, it's interesting that it was a film before. And I had read this too, and I was worried. So I did the same research as you. I, I was... Concerned that I had to sort of pivot this episode at the last minute to being something completely different. But it's interesting that it's like played with the MacGuffin. Yeah. Which I think we'll be talking a lot more about MacGuffins as we get into this review. We will indeed. And I wish I had stumbled across this information earlier because I would have watched Rome Express. It is on YouTube for those who are interested. I would have watched it in advance of watching Night Train to... Night. See, I just did it. Night Train. Yeah. <laughs> it, yeah. As, yeah. Yes, I would have watched it uh, in advance of watching Sleeping Car to Trieste. Uh, do you know where Trieste is? Italy, right? Yeah. I had to look that up, actually, surprisingly. Just I did, too. European. <laughs> yeah. So you haven't been? Not No, not to Trieste or Italy, to be fair. Um, I, I'm, I'm a pretty bad uh, traveler. Are you now tempted to get a sleeping car to Trieste? <laughs> I'm not. I have always wanted to go on the Orient Express, though. I think you need to take a sleeping car to Trieste and like really like highlight that aspect when you tell people about the story that you're reliving the experience of the movie Sleeping Car to Trieste. <laughs> and then they section me in one of the cars and lock me in, right? Exactly, yes. Yeah, or who's, you who's you wind up diving in front of an oncoming train like the other guy in the movie. Yeah. <laughs> no, I'll find my way into the galley and try and tell the chef how to prepare the food. Brit- <laughs> British style. I want to come back to that. Um, so the original uh, Rome Express was uh, conceived by a writer named Clifford Gray. So he was an actor in his mid-teens. And when I say that, I mean the 19-teens versus the age teen. Um, <laughs> Child right? labor. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, hey, in those days, <laughs> come on. That, that's true. That is yeah. true. That's true. Um, but he eventually evolved into writing um, Broadway stage scores. Hmm. And he became a lyricist, and a lot of his work wound up being adapted into film. So his first couple credits were plays that he worked on, 1925's Sally and 1927's A Kiss in a Taxi. Um, And um, he was also someone who wrote a lot of songs because of his lyricist work Mm -hmm. and is credited to this day with music in major motion pictures i've got a few credits here so like recent films oh yeah yeah so uh in the movie amelie he had a song on there called got a date with an angel in the wolf of wall street he wrote the song dream lover and in wonder woman he wrote another little drink wouldn't do us any harm and most recently in paul thomas anderson's licorice pizza his song "Sometimes I'm Happy" appears. Forget you know Conrad Veidt and seances. This is this is the guy that's like reaching out from the grave and interfering with Hollywood. Yeah, isn't that crazy? Like this guy, if you go through his song credits, it's like the entire history of motion pictures. So he wrote some standards basically that just get used a lot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And his writing career, um, he he got his first actual writing credit because previously it was plays being adapted. Uh, mm-hmm. His first real credit was in 1932 in a movie called Lord Babs and wrote a few films, nothing that was particularly noteworthy. This was his actual final theatrical feature uh, that he wrote. Um, but, you know, otherwise he's just really known for all of this song work. And this movie was just following up a um, a film that he worked on called Stacker's Lila Sven which was an international film. The the great classic, of course. Yes, yes. 
So, I just can't believe you're dunking on old Clifford Gray right now. No, no, I think he's a, I think he's amazing. I loved going through his uh, music credits. I thought that was a blast. So he's credited with a story on this movie because obviously they're just taking the initial script from Rome Express. Mm -hmm. The writer who actually tackled this material was Alan McKinnon, who started off in the late 30s working in TV movies, which, yes, were a thing. We stumbled across this previously, Scott, on the show. where yeah, someone crazy, was, isn't it? Yeah, where someone was credited with like a 1930s TV movie. Um, same case here. He wrote a movie called They're Off, and then mostly just worked in B-movies. And this was following up a movie called Unpublished Story from 1942. But he did write a, a notable movie, actually, that I came across. In 1953, he wrote... The Saints Girl Friday, which was one of the Simon Templar movie films, which sent me down an internet rabbit hole and made me realize there's like nine The Saint movies that I did not know about previously that have been added to our master list to cover one day in the future. They were all made between the 1930s and 50s. Um, they're very hard to track down a lot of them. So we'll see how that really goes when it actually comes to the idea of tackling them. But I would love to do it. Was Simon Templar a spy? Yeah. Yeah, totally. Okay. And okay. He, he was sure. played in several of these movies, not this one that I'm referring to, but in the majority of them, he was played by George Sanders, who we talked about most recently. The thumb guy. Yes, yes. <laughs> I, I, it has a wonderful career, folks. I've been dunking on George Sanders since Lancer Spy came out. So That's uh, right. Sorry, George. Lancer spy icon, but of course, uh, known for many other amazing works, including his uh, Academy Award winning work in All About Eve. Um, and uh, yeah, Alan McKinnon worked for basically into the late 50s. There was also some uncredited work by William Douglas Holm, who was a Scottish writer. This was his first ever credited material, and he wasn't actually mm -hmm. credited. But if you go and look at IMDb, it's his first credit as uncredited work, you know, kind of that classic case. It loves doing that on IMDb. I never understand why. Yeah, it's like his first sort of um, quietly acknowledged work. Uh, we whisper about it in the back rooms. Did you ever <laughs> car to Trieste? Yeah, don't talk about that. Spy Hard's gossip <laughs> source, uh, William Douglas Holm. We got it. We got it from uh, Conrad's uh, seance. <laughs> his most uh, noteworthy credit, I think, was probably 1958's *The Reluctant Debutante*, which was directed by Vincent Minnelli who was the father of Liza Minnelli and one-time husband of Judy Garland, directed a lot of the classic musicals, and it was starring Rex Harrison. You may not have seen that movie, but it was remade in 2003 as What a Girl Wants with Amanda Bynes. Yeah, I, I never saw that film, to be fair, but I know Amanda Bynes. I think I used to watch her on Nickelodeon back in the day. Yeah, that was like one of her star vehicles that came out around that point. I think she was in like something with Frankie Muniz. Was it Big Liar or something? And I think What a Girl Wants followed that. I, I'll take your word for it. I didn't know you were such a, a, a Bynes hard. I've never seen any of these movies, but it's like <laughs> they were being marketed to me on TV. So it's like they just kind of lodged their way into my brain. Then what's that on your wall in the background, Cam? <laughs> no comment. <laughs> and this movie was directed by John Paddy Carstairs, who, London-born director, he was the son of an actor named Nelson Keyes who was best known for probably a movie called The Scarlet Daredevil, kind of an adventure film. Mm -hmm. And um, John Paddy Carstairs got his start as a writer in 1931 with a movie called Footsteps in the Night, and then moved into directing in 1933 with a movie called Paris Plain. This man has a very prolific string of movies. They're pretty much all B-movies, like not a lot with a lot of name value that leaps off the page. Um, but he did in 1939 direct a movie called The Saint in London. <laughs> and I was like, oh my God, we've got Saint connections all over the place. Is that a George Sanders film by any chance? That one is, yes. Wow, it's all connecting. Lance the Spy Lives. Uh-huh. And uh, this was his follow-up to a 1947 Richard Attenborough film called Dancing with Crime. <laughs> sure. <laughs> cool. <laughs> yeah. And one of his last movies that... I did not know about is the actual final theatrical film it was a movie called The Devil's Agent, co-starring Christopher Lee. That is a spy film that has now been added to our master list. The Devil's Agent. Is it scary? I wonder. Is it a Halloween spy movie? Could we do? I don't think it is, but I oh, wish it was. I'd love that. It's Christopher Lee as well. Like he kind of want that sort of hammer horror thing going on and a lot of cackling. Wouldn't it be amazing if like Christopher Lee played the devil? 
and was mm. being recruited to go on a spy mission. I mean, it's that's a universe I want to live in. Yeah. Well. Yeah. Who's recruiting the devil? Like who? Like who has the tenacity to be like, I'm gonna get the devil to do some stuff for me. Well, it's got to be like a specter-like organization, right? Oh, so he's working for the bad guys. He's not working for the good guys. Well, I don't know. Okay, maybe it's like to take down the ultimate bad, you need the the even more ultimate bad. Yeah, isn't that like they got the rock in to take down Vin Diesel? Mm, or Alien versus Predator. Whoever wins, we lose. <laughs> <laughs> we all lost when we saw that film. <laughs> Both of them. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And uh, so this movie, the original title was Sleeping Car to Venice. Mm-hmm. They changed it to Trieste. I am not sure why. Sounds nicer. I guess so. But if you look at like newspaper clippings of the time, they were referring to it as the sleeping car to Venice. Um, and then a few notes just on some of the actors. Jean Kent, the star of the movie who plays Valia, later said she didn't really like the film and didn't get on very well with the director and said, you never knew where you were with him. I don't remember enjoying it. I had silly clothes. I wanted to be very French in plain black and a little beret, but I had to wear these silly new look clothes. I was playing a super spy of some kind, but who was I spying for? That is a very good question that I, I think we need to tackle shortly. <laughs> Forget Conrad Veidt. Let's get out the seance and bring up Jean Kent. She should be hosting this show with us. <laughs> Sassy Jean, that's what we call her on this show. Also, I, I love the way she refers to her outfits as new wave or something. It's like new look. A new look. It's like the oldest stuff I've ever seen in my <laughs> life. <laughs> but in like 1948, this was bold, daring stuff. She's, she's wearing like a petticoat and like a, a floral arrangement in her hair. It's like, oh, this, this, new, this new stuff the kids are wearing. <laughs> ah, I want my burlap sack back. Thank you. <laughs> Very avant-garde. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And the co- her co-star, um, Albert Levin, who played Zerta, he was attached to the rank organization, signed by the rank organization who produced mm-hmm. this film. And there was a news story that was actually something that was kind of fun where they noted this was the first movie he'd made with them in five years. They basically signed him, cast him in a movie initially, and then basically he just did nothing for five years on the payroll. Wonderful. Yeah, and there was a in in 1951 when he was getting another job. So basically, he did this film and then nothing else. Mm. Uh, but in 1951, there was a news headline that said, "Idol star gets role at last." <laughs> <laughs> the fact that the trades are writing about it as well. It must be a slow news day. They're like, "Oh, he's finally he's finally come out of his cave." <laughs> Albert Levin, he's finally doing something. <laughs> Everybody clap. (laughs) So he would go on and do some things of note. He actually co-stars in The Guns of Navarone, which we will cover. That's a really Mm -hmm. big movie. He also appears in The Devil's Agent. Oh. Uh Uh-huh. Yeah. I have to look that film up now. Yeah. And this was also the film debut of Rona Anderson, who made a lot of movies, but probably is best remembered as playing Alice in the 1951 Alistair Sim version of A Christmas Carol. I do not think I've seen that one. Oh, really? Like, that was a standard in my house growing up. Um, Maybe I have. I've seen so many versions of that film. It doesn't it doesn't jump out to me. Okay, that's fair. In terms of the name. I feel like every, you know, group of people, family or whatever, somehow stumbles across their version of A Christmas Carol that becomes, like, the obvious one, whether it's the Muppets one, Mickey's Christmas Carol, the, the Alistair Sim. Yeah. It was the Muppets for us, I think. But yeah. uh, we also then just took turns watching The Devil's Agent as well. Of course, yes. Uh, I could not find financial information on this movie, which is no surprise. Mm-hmm. Um, but I did find a news story that it was one of the top British money makers in the US. Apparently, a lot of British films had flopped when they were actually mm-hmm. sent across the seas. This one actually broke through and was notably like quite a big success in New York. Okay. I can understand how it might be a success. Mm-hmm. Sure. The top three for the year. Number one was The Snake Pit, which is an Olivia de Havilland film about a woman who is sent to a uh, mental institution. Very good movie. Uh, kind of like a like Girl Interrupted. Okay, sure. Yeah. Yeah. And number two was Red River, which is one of John Wayne's best movies. And number three was the Humphrey Bogart film Key Largo. 
There's times when you say these films to me, and I know, like, in your head, you're like, oh, Key Largo, man, what a <laughs> film. Uh, and I'm like... That's like, yep. Yep, yeah, that's, that's a film that existed. Yep. I, yep. I, don't, I don't know what to... I, I, listeners, guys, I'm sure Key Largo is great. Cam, I'm sure you love it, too. We all love Humphrey Bogart, so what can I say? I'm sure it's wonderful. It is. Fantastic movie. And my only final note on this was that actually Rome Express was remade again in 1950 as a French production. Uh, They stuck with the original name Rome Express. Mm -hmm. And in that film, they switched it back to a missing painting. So the spy element did not carry forward. Well, I guess we'll never have to tackle this one again. Nope. This sums up uh, pretty much the entire history of Rome Express. It's a little bit like when we did No Way Out, which was adapted from The Big Clock. And I went and watched The Big Clock, and it had Mm. absolutely nothing to do with spycraft whatsoever. Also, like, True Lies is based on a French film, I think. Yeah, that one is based on a French film, although it's a pretty one-to-one in terms of, like, the spy element. Okay. Why aren't we tackling that one? It's not available. I would love to. Oh, sure. Okay, fine. Well, the train is about to depart, so I guess we should talk about the film now. Sleeping car to Trieste. What did I think? I think I'll go first. Do you know what? This film was utterly charming Mm -hmm. in many ways for me. I love the characters. I love the setting. I love the tension. I love some of the situations. What I don't love is the fact that I still don't know what's going on. (laughs) And I've watched it twice. Oh, okay. Yeah, I, 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 I... It's... Hard to track, I have to say. I think something gets lost in translation. Not that it was translated. But it, I, I don't know who's working for whom or why most people are doing anything. But I'm mostly fine with that because I'm hanging out with these characters in this very weird environment that is forcing relationships where they wouldn't usually exist. You're putting people in different compartments with each other. People are meeting each other. You've also got this chase that's happening live throughout this train journey that you're watching and it's like a countdown for when they get to Trieste sort of a ticking clock going on it's all very interesting stuff I think the performances are mostly good too uh, I just I, I just found myself baffled by the plot the whole time which I, I thought was a bit of a shame because I think if you'd done that I would have said it was a complete home run I'm in a similar boat this one I thought I was in trouble maybe 35 minutes in mm. Because, and this is not an issue with the movie, but like the YouTube version out there, the audio is not spectacular. No. And I found that sometimes I was like struggling to kind of make out what some people were saying. Not all, but there were certain actors who just didn't come across as well as, as some of their co-stars yeah. in the audio mix. And um, I I was sitting there going like, okay, I'm having a real tough time tracking these like large group of characters. And I was reminded actually very quickly in 1932, there was a movie called grand hotel, which was a big smash hit one, I believe best picture that year. And I think that was the only Oscar it was nominated for was best picture. Very weird situation. Hmm. But um, that was the movie that kind of popularized the big ensemble film where everyone has these little stories that all kind of interconnect. And that one is just people in a hotel and the influence was pretty big. And this kind of had that same vibe. You know, it's arriving like 16 years later, but it wouldn't shock me if the filmmakers are looking at something like Grand Hotel for inspiration. And I think it did a really good job of creating unique dynamics between its characters, like Mm -hmm. within their individual lives. The problem was that for the first 35 minutes or so, I try to take notes through these movies. Like, I'm taking notes on things so that when I read my notes before we record, it's going to jog my memory about everything I saw. I didn't know the names of anyone, and I found it impossible. I was, like, pulling up IMDb, and I still couldn't match a lot of the actors' faces to the people I was seeing on screen. Mm -hmm. And I was just looking at this sea of names going, like, oh, my God. Like, I'm going to have to make the most, like, vague references to each of these individuals. And around the 35, 40 minute, things came more into focus for me where I was like, okay, I'm now beginning to understand the relationships. And once Mm. we kind of got to, you know, the whole thing is about this missing diary with a, you know, a bunch of spy information. Once that became an actual element driving the plot, then I found the movie really clicked into focus. But basically that 35 minutes of setup, I was... uh, rather lost for chunks of it 
I think I think I was struggling a little bit longer. There's a murder about sixty minutes into this ninety minute film, maybe just slightly before that. Yeah. Where the the sort of the traitor the spy traitor, there's a bunch of spies, but one betrays the other. Mm. That traitor is killed. Yeah. And on board there happens to be this fantastic world renowned chief inspector. Uh who basically just call him Poirot. Uh, who, who then says he's going to help solve the Mildare. Yeah. And so then goes and does it. And But that that sort of seeing the train journey through his eyes, you you get to learn everyone's names a bit better and everyone's motivations are all sort of spelled out more or less because he's investigating them. He's asking them what they're doing on the train. So you hear it. Uh, I think that helped me more. I also think that was a bit punchier. I think that, that section there was just a, like the tension ramped up a little bit by that point because you knew there was only one bad guy left and was he going to get off the train or not i felt so dumb when it came to that detective character because when he enters the film he really does kind of like wrangle all the kind of the parts into one cohesive story Mm -hmm. and i was like man this character's great where was he earlier and then i remembered that i'd been watching him in multiple scenes where he's playing the radio in the car with the other guy but i for some reason wasn't making the connection between his two kind of functions in the story. Mm-hmm. Uh, I I found that like it was often keep, hard to keep track of just characters in this. Like so many like bland white dudes in this film. They all look the same. Exactly. Yes. Like there is the dude who you mentioned earlier, who's like bothering the chef, talking about cod, and how apparently the English just drink uh, drink <laughs> eat boiled cod. Is that true, Scott? Do you have boiled cod? On? No, we we drink it. Oh, you drink it. Yeah, okay, okay. You like liquefy yeah. it and then drink it. Yeah. So is yeah, boiled yeah. cod a big deal for you? Uh, we prefer it battered and fried. <laughs> okay. Um, but you had that dude given quite a bit of time. You also had the kind of the renegade spy, the one the other two are trying to catch. Mm-hmm. Uh, Pool is the uh, character's name, and Pool looks. Almost identical to the guy talking about cod. <laughs> they both have similar mustaches and and strange vocal patterns. So you're just like, this, and then also you've got the police detective and the other spy, the other male spy, look very similar. Yeah, because they're all wearing the same suit as well. Basically, they're all wearing like darkish suits and sort of handsomeish leading men looks by all of them. So it's like. You could just have everyone swap the roles around. You wouldn't know the difference. And you have that introduction where they're stealing the diary mm-hmm. and Poole takes off with the, you know, turns on them. And Poole is played by Alan Wheatley. Uh, that's At that point in the movie, he's wearing like a trench coat and like a fedora. Mm. And then they cut to that train and I'm looking at the dude talking to the chef about cod. And I'm like, I guess that's the same guy. Yeah. <laughs> I was I yeah. was lost. Yeah. And also it happens with the two... Like I say, love interests loosely. One is a love interest. One is more just like an accomplice, I think. And they're in a car together, and they look very similar too. Also, both wearing the same dresses. Yeah. Like, yeah, I, I, I know it's hard to differentiate without the use of color. This is a black and white film, folks, to point out. But I've seen black and white films where you could tell the difference between everyone. So maybe it's a casting issue there. Yeah, it's not the sort of thing that uh, I was raising as an issue when we were talking about, you know, Lancer Spy or, you know, British Agent or a lot of the other ones we've tackled. Well, in Lancer Spy, they said everyone looked the same, so it's fine. Yeah, exactly. They all look like George Sanders, so it's fine. Yeah, there's so many doppelgangers in the world, it's fine. Makes perfect yeah. sense. Uh, but I, I think, like, an overall, like, takeaway for me is it was a fun film to watch. It wasn't, like, a, a, a painful 90 minutes by any stretch of the imagination. I just think that, like, it just didn't rise up to its own potential for me. Like, I think there's a, it's a really intriguing story. Like, they, they've stolen these goods from an embassy in, I think it's in Paris, right? Yeah. Yeah, from a, a mayor in Paris. This book full of war secrets, and they're going to sell it, sell their country out. And so they have an accomplice who betrays them. They follow him onto the train, and it's a chase of them get this book back to, I don't know, sell their country out. At the same time, you have all these other lives of the people that are on the train. And this is a, a sleeping car. So it's people are stuck on this train for 24 hours, basically. Hmm. And you have people coming in and coming off. Uh, and I think that's actually a really fascinating little bubble world 
that you're observing. And there's so many fun characters in there. Yeah, you've got like the author, the Scottish author, who is amazing. I know. Minimal screen time, but you just want to punch him in the face. Yeah. It's great. Uh, he's played by Finlay Curry, and the character's name is Alistair McBain. And uh, he is incredible in this movie absolutely incredible and he's backed up by another actor who has some interesting uh, connectivity to our past Uh uh-huh you're talking about hugh burden who played mills i certainly am do you know what you well you've done the research but uh yeah there's a little connection to a very old spy film for us he played uh is it haynes in one of our dinosaurs is missing which mm. sent me down another rabbit hole, Scott. Oh, no. Because I was trying to remember Haynes in Dinosaurs. And I was going like, what was the character's full name? And for some reason, the name Guy Haynes popped into my brain. And I was like Googling Guy Haynes. And then it's like, no, no, that's the, the one of the lead characters of Hitchcock's Strangers on a Train. Mm. Uh, that's why that had popped into my brain. But through that Google search, I also realized that one of the agents that Bond reveals in Quantum of Solace when he goes to the opera, one of the quantum mm. characters, is Guy Haynes. That's what the character is credited as. And he was the character who was originally tied into the ending that was cut, where Mr. White was killed, and Bond was going to encounter Guy Haynes, which is why he probably has a full name in the credits. So they were actually putting in a stealth Hitchcock reference in Quantum of Solace. There we go, folks. Wow. We didn't even pick up on that when we did our quantum review. Nope. I did not realize it. I mean, he would have been like 30th build or something like that. Yeah. Sure, 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 sure. Uh, yeah, actually, the actor who plays that guy, the name left my brain, but actually recently passed away. Oh, did he? Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah quite yeah. young, quite young. Yeah. He's a comedian mostly known for here in Britain. Uh, mm. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, let's get into things that we liked about the old sleeping car to Trieste, that old choo-choo train. I'm going to say it out front. I, I love whodunits. Mm-hmm. They're like one of my favorite types of movies. So this is a whodunit spy film? It is, although you know who did it. True. I mean, oftentimes in whodunits, you do know it's about the watching people figure it out. Yes. Because you'll get that clip at the start of the film where you see the murder happen and then you then watch things unfold. It's not often that you have the whole thing hidden away from the viewer. Yeah, I mean, the real suspense is how they're going to reveal that Zerta was actually guilty in killing Pool and framing. Um, I will I will also point out, it, it's, uh, it's unfortunate that he's been done for murder. Well, actually, he wasn't done for anything. He was flattened by a train. But that guy fell on his own knife. Yes. Are you talking about uh, Pool? Yeah, he uh, yeah. a very unfortunate way to go out. Uh, that's uh, <laughs> falling backwards onto your own knife, poor lad, and dying instantly. <laughs> yeah, there's there's no like oh ah, it was like hit the knife dead. It's like a, it's like a, the heart attack in Lance the Spy. It's like well, he's gone. <laughs> the goulash heart attack. Yeah, yeah. Um, I thought that like once it kind of set up that crime case and the inspector mm-hmm. came in, it was very concise. Like it was a well made, you know. Um, kind of who done it there, mm-hmm. and the kind of the character dramas of setting up who was when and where during this murder, and the way the inspectors meeting with them all, like all that was really well played out. And because we'd spent that hour with the characters, we were invested in all of the personalities. So when you have you know the character of George Grant and uh, you know his um, his I guess adulterous mistress. Like, are, mm. they are set up as adulterers, although I'm unclear if they ever actually conceived anything or if it's like they keep being kind of interrupted. Well, they do kiss. They do kiss. And he is married. Yes, he is married. But like... Apparently that's fine with Cam, folks. So uh, get, <laughs> get, get smooching. Cam's free. But they're like kissing and they keep saying like, come to my car later. And then they keep getting interrupted, right? Like, consistently throughout the movie. Is that your pickup line there, Cam? <laughs> yes, Come yes. to my car later. Yeah. Um, but they keep getting interrupted, and that's kind of one of the running jokes of the movie. And mm. then it ends with her, I think, coming to her senses and going back to Paris. And that character is Rona Anderson's Joan uh, Maxted. But I liked how they set those two up as being embroiled in a murder. It's interesting. It's the two characters who are doing something that could be 
especially in those days, seen as, you know, immoral, mm. right? Like it's the two people that are considering adultery are the ones that are framed for a murder. Um, I thought that was an interesting choice. And you know they're innocent, so it's more about the suspense, about seeing how ultimately they are exonerated and how Zerta is revealed. But I thought they did a good job kind of setting the pieces in place and throwing in wild cards like the... Um, McBain character who kind of holds the keys to everything, but mm. is such a bizarro, unpredictable character that you don't know what he's going to do. Well, I'm back to the couple just very briefly. It's interesting that you point out that sort of the disdain towards adultery in those days and now, mm-hmm. but perhaps more then, because that adds a level of sort of context as to why the police inspector might believe that he is the murderer because he is a disingenuous person. Yeah. Yeah. Whereas now, I don't know if people would like. I'm not sure in a police investigation if someone had cheated that would really matter. <laughs> They're like guilty. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Lock him up. There he goes. He stole that bread. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. So I, I'm I'm not sure about that. But uh, I well, that's another one of my loves. I maybe I'll just throw it in before you chuck one of yours in. Is mm. just the the side characters, the bizarre, fully fleshed out. I will add in side characters. You've got the GI who's traveling to Trieste and. <laughs> Like, that feels like uh, the British interpretation of what an American is like. <laughs> he's like reading Time magazine and Life magazine and the New York Post, and he doesn't so understand horny. anything. He's so horny. <laughs> he's just ch- chasing them hat girls around the train. <laughs> he's like showing up in their car trying to give them alcohol, these two young girls who are basically just conning him to smuggle stuff across a border. Yeah. yeah play him like a fiddle. Uh, it's great. And like he- he's stuck in a cabin with the most like stuck up. British ornithologist who's like the biggest nerd you could ever think of but a really nice guy and turns out to be like the the keys to the kingdom when it comes to like how that is ended because they go out to dinner with his friend who happens to be drop dead gorgeous yeah and the GI almost walks off and then he goes like hubba hubba and runs (laughs) after them when he sees her like it's definitely a a British uh, interpretation of Americans oh he's amazing I was like bursting out loud uh, laughing every time he was on screen and the actor's name is uh, Bonar Kalino um, what's his first name sorry it's b-o-n-a-r <laughs> <laughs> we're just giggling at the name folks sorry we are children it kind of informs the character doesn't it <laughs> it really like they cast it well i'll say that yeah yeah he is a pure stereotype and he's oh yeah a lot of fun and i think like you know in terms of my likes i really just have to kind of jump off of what you're saying like the supporting cast they're crucial to making a movie like this work because it's not really plot driven. Uh, it is that grand hotel kind of format where it's like, if you don't care about the interpersonal dramas of these, you know, pairs of characters, you're bored out of your mind yeah. or you're confused. Um, and just having like David Tomlinson shows up in this. We saw him, I think in the liquidator, I think, but he's best known as Mr. Banks in Mary Poppins. And, you know, he was in The Love Bug and a lot of the classic Disney stuff, um, Bed Knobs and Broomsticks. So he is an absolute joy as this just idiot stockbroker yeah. who's just dragging the George character away from his, you know, mistress and into like poker games and just, you know, ridiculous shenanigans. I thought he was a lot of fun. He just wants to hang out with everyone. Yeah. Like he just wants to like, hey, let's go do stuff. And everyone's like, no, oh, I'm tired. He's like, no, oh, let's do it anyway. He's that, like, happy puppy you have in the house. I like, though, that he's portrayed as kind of an idiot. But at the same time, he is kind of the saving grace. Like, he helps capture Zerta at the end. He's crucial in ultimately getting his friend free. Yeah, and, like, he has a... Uh, even at the end, he goes and, like, says his, takes his friend out for dinner at the end. And it just seems very sweet. Like, it might be an idiot, but he's, like, a, a, a well-meaning idiot. Much like us. Yeah, because, like, you know, George and Joan break up at the end of the movie and George mm-hmm. is kind of down and you know the Tomlinson character Tom just sweeps right in and is like come on buddy we're going out for dinner now yeah and it's like yeah it's like if they wrote this character now as an idiot stockbroker he would be douche city absolutely and I Wolf like that street style yeah yeah I like that here he's um he's kind of I'm sure a kind of a stereotype of a stockbroker at that point in time, but he's kind of driven more by like fun and his friendship. Yeah, he just wants to have a good time. Yeah. Just wants to party. Uh I I, I did have one additional like it, it's just I I liked the ending. 
Oh, yeah. I thought the ending was very appropriate, yeah. Didn't see it coming. I thought like he'd have one of those like 39 steps where they hang off the side of the train or something like that, but nope. He jumps out the side and gets completely steamrolled by another train. That moment strongly echoes a Hitchcock movie called Shadow of a Doubt. And I can't recall at the moment which one came first. So if the Hitchcock one was first, then I think it's very likely this was influenced. And if not, maybe Hitchcock was influenced by this movie. And I can see you're looking up, so thank you very much. But it definitely jumped out to me and was very effective. It was a really like uh, a great, like, whoa, didn't see that coming kind of moment. I can tell you that Shadow of a Doubt came out in 1943. I think, yeah, I think that this movie may have been borrowing from that. Hey, if you're going to borrow from anyone, borrow from Alfred Hitchcock. Yeah, totally. And I just want to circle back to the McBain character. Sure. Who, this is an incredible character. Mm -hmm. This, like, political writer who is, like, the celebrity they're bringing on board. And just by himself, he's hilarious. All these, like, very, like, stern, kind of snippy lines he has. But then you have the dynamic between him and his, like, assistant, which is just the most toxic environment possible. And the way that, you know, this poor servant, or, or he's basically a servant, but I guess he's an assistant, but is just, like, browbeaten mm -hmm. and ordered around. There's a bit where he has to read newspapers to him, and I was, like, laughing out loud at just, like, the way he was, like, tossing barbs back at him while he's reading the paper. The way that turns into, like, a blackmail situation later on, Yeah, I was like, this is perfect. Like, this is really well played, really well set up. And just the way that, like, the McBain character stumbles across the diary, it's so perfect. This is the perfect character to kind of tie into this intrigue. It's got, like, the uh, Smithers-Mr. Burns relationship going on there. It does, yeah. That's a great comparison, yeah. And I, I don't... The actor who played McBain, uh, Finley Curry, um, I don't have a lot of memories of seeing him in things, but he was in Ben-Hur as Balthazar... Uh, he was in Around the World in 80 Days, Ivanhoe, Great Expectations. Like, he was in some really big movies. So I need to look up some screen caps because I would have seen him in a lot of these things. He also appeared, Scott, in the TV show The Saint. <laughs> Everything, all roads lead back to The Saint, apparently, this episode. Yeah, yeah. So, how uh, weird, how bizarre. Yeah. Well, I mean, as for the McBain character, you're right, an absolute blast. I will, I... I I've loved every moment where he would just turn to Mills, his assistant, and be like, Mills, what's the time? Yeah. Pull out the old medicine cabinet and give him his medicine, but he could easily just grab himself. It's right next to him. But no, no, Mills has to do it for him. It's, it's that real like power flex that you hate. But like he's doing this world tour of, of lecturing, but it turns out everywhere he goes, he's not particularly wanted. <laughs> so he just gets like flustered by it and sends him angry letters. One of the strengths of this type of movie is like you often hear these kind of ensemble films criticized as like no one would care about this story if it was its own movie like it just it feels thin and we tackled love actually on the um, patreon and like there was some in there like the emma thompson alan rickman one which was really compelling and could work as its own movie and then there was others where you're like this this is very thin. the guy who goes abroad to get tail exactly like so mm -hmm. thin I would watch an entire movie about the McBain character. And he has, what, like six, seven minutes of screen time or something? Not even that, I'd say, really. Yeah. And and there's a few stories like that that I think that is a credit to the movie and that a, a number of these kind of interpersonal stories could work for, you know, more screen time. Well, the the married couple, not sorry, the married couple, the adulterous couple, as again, like they are framed to be villainous because they are adulterers. But you care about them. He's he's framed for murder. Like you don't want him to see him go down for that. You want the bad guys to get taken down instead. So you, you're you're on board. But they're not even your protagonists. No, they're B characters. Why on earth would you care about set dressing? But you do. And that's like a criticism I've had of other movies we've tackled, where I've said, you know, when you underwrite a character, mm. it doesn't make it'll never make your movie better. No. Uh, in this case, it's like all the supporting cast, even the fish guy, even the guy who's sitting there bothering the chef talking about cod, like he's just comic relief, but he's really memorable. And you've got like the, uh, there's like a different, there's a whole crew of like butlers on the on the train or like assistants or whatever you call them. 
And they've got different characters, different personalities. You've got the one who's like clearly like drunk and taking bribes from everyone and messing them around, and the really stiff upper lipped guy who didn't like getting a tip from the the author. Yeah, there's so many things going on on this train at once, but it's also like a very static set, which I'll get to in a minute. But I just think it's just a, a marvel of screenwriting, I'd say. Mm-hmm. And even the character, um, you know, who plays Detector Inspector Jolliffe, who kind of takes center stage towards the end of the movie, played mm-hmm. by Paul De- Depuy? Depuis? I'm not exactly sure on that one. Um, I would happily watch a movie. Dupois. Dupois. I would yeah. happily watch a movie about him just solving a case. Like he's compelling yeah. enough, and I like that he is really into jazz music. Uh, well, I, I hang on. I've got two things to say about that. Firstly, I will say anyone playing their music on a train, I hope, gets thrown out and hit by a train coming the other way, because mm. that is the most obnoxious thing in the world. So when he got, he pulled out like like that personal jazz music box. Mm-hmm. I was like, oh, this guy, I'm going to hate this guy. And he turned out to be one of the heroes of the film. And I will also add, he's so successful, I want to see him in his own U.S. Marshall style spinoff. Oh, I'd be down for that. Yeah. Yeah. The, 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 well, I was going to say the Dubois boys, but it's not. It's the uh, Jolife. Yeah, that's... Inspector, Detective Inspector Jolife. I, I prefer du, Dubois. I think it actually sounds like a cooler detective name. Detective Dubois. Yeah. Yeah. But anyway, yeah, I, I think he could have held up on his own spin off, really. I thought it was interesting that at the end he's putting the moves on the uh <laughs> the, the female like, spy the that's being arrested for aiding and abetting a murder. Yeah, great. Yeah. Like they're like, Well, you're still under uh, suspicion for being an accomplice to um, you know, Zerta. Would you like jazz? Yeah. Do you wanna go out for drinks now? And I'm like, Oh my goodness <laughs> An abuse of power right there. Yeah, Valia, apparently very enticing to the inspector. Uh, Wow. I was going to say, though, about the music box, I actually have a story that's somewhat uh, similar. Um, I recently was in Calgary attending the Fan Expo there, and I uh, was on a plane home, and my plane kept getting delayed. It was supposed to be at like 11.15 at night. It wound up being 3 a.m. when we departed Calgary. Uh, And so I'm on the plane people are tired, right? Like everyone Mm. is just zonked from waiting for this plane that keeps kept being delayed. I think we had three delays. Um, And so we get on the plane. I am sitting next to the the dude, the only person who's like, well, I'm turning on a light and reading a book the whole time. It's a pitch black plane. And only the guy next to me is like, well, tough for you guys. I got a book to read. I, I just try to think how you could have ruined that guy's book or something. If I knew the ending, I would have said the ending. Yeah. Yeah. Shock. They throw the ring into the lava. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No. Yeah. I, that, that is fairly obnoxious. I, I, I've seen people get told off on night flights for putting the lights on, actually. I'm surprised he wasn't. I was so tired that I just kind of nodded off anyway. And same mm. with the girl on the other side of him. Uh, but I'm sure we were both of similar minds of being like, who is this douchebag? No, for sure. And, and to be fair, I don't wish death upon people who do that. It's a bit harsh. But I, I will say, in terms of uh, uncivilized behavior, playing music loudly on any type of carriage, train, bus, anything like that is a, a dick move. Yeah, I'll give you a pass at like 11 o'clock or midnight, like whatever. But or when if you're it's a like, kid, like you're sure. a two-year-old or something, fine. Yeah, But like 3.30 in the morning? Come on. Ah, uh, man. Nah. We interrupt this program to bring you a special report. Attention, spy hards, die hards. Independent podcasting. Much like the spy game requires considerable resources, whether it's research, equipment, hosting, or of course, constructing a hidden moon base, we're putting out the call for your support. That's right, the Spy Hearts Patreon is the home to our ever-growing lineup of Agents in the Field episodes where we decode non-spy films from your favorite spy actors, and The Debrief, where we activate our billion-dollar brains and predict how the spy movie news of today will shape tomorrow. Cam, what have we got in our crosshairs this month? Due to the actors and writers' strikes going on, news is a little sparse, so for The Debrief this month, we are going to deliver a special declassified review of the new Gal Gadot spy thriller, Heart of Stone. Hopefully, it doesn't sink. 
So accept your mission and hop in the Hellmobile today at patreon.com slash spyheart. But before Spectre agents intercept this broadcast, let's get back to the spy jinx. Well, speaking of bad things, hmm, let's talk about our dislikes. I kind of said mine really early on. I'll just, maybe we'll just talk about it a little bit more, but like it's, it's the plot. Yeah. Like it, it, I know there's not much of a plot, but trying to follow who is doing what and who is who is rough in this film. This movie is interesting from the point of view of spy hearts because is it a spy movie? Like there are spies, but like everything that's driving this, the whole like MacGuffin of the diary could be switched to anything. I mean, it is a painting in the other films. Yeah. And whether it is spy related or not, it never matters in the movie. Well, they're thieves. They they're thieves. They they're not necessarily spies. They could have been stealing jewels. Yeah, or money. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So the, I I totally get that argument. But they are framed as being spies. So I think it, it it qualifies for us to talk about. I'm not saying the last hour of this podcast is a waste. No, 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 not at uh, all. I, not at all. I don't think that's the case. But like I I know what you're saying. No, I did have that same worry whilst I was watching the film. But also, it's like in. Certain movies, like, you know, the Hitchcock stuff with the MacGuffin. The MacGuffin drives the movie in a way that is pretty uh, propulsive. Mm. Whereas here, it didn't feel particularly invested in the MacGuffin. It comes into play later on, but it's really the murder that is kind of what gets the movie really kicked into gear. I expected more more drama built around the location of the diary the diary being kind of passed around or something like that. It, it's kind of irrelevant, more or less. Well, that's one thing I found interesting because I thought the, the book, when he leaves, because the sort of second, maybe the first act is, is the, the chap who gets killed is being moved from carriage to carriage and he wants to be in his own berth, but they keep putting him with other people, including the, the detective inspector. And so he, he finally gets his own room, so he hides the book and then gets kicked out of the book that room because the author's coming in. At that point, I expected the author to find the book and then to leave it in, like, the food car and then it ends up with, like, maybe the 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 people who are being unfaithful. Mm-hmm. Or to, to move from person to person, and like a hot cake, and he's, he's constantly chasing the book yeah. as well as being chased by someone else. But he hides the book in that room and then you don't see it again until, like, the last 15 minutes of the film. Yeah, and like there's some genuine tension, like in the poker game, where um you know Pool is dragged out to the poker game, and then Zerta shows up, mm-hmm. and the two of them are like face to face at a poker table, and like the tension really comes across well, but you kind of expect more tension to be driven by the actual diary, mm. and it really isn't at all. It's more about the personalities, which I guess I can't complain if the movie is being driven by character as opposed to a plot device that's probably for the better but you still expect the diary to matter a little bit more like just a little more it felt very insignificant to me i i think if that's the problem is it felt insignificant it should have felt important but it didn't necessarily matter what it was yeah uh but unfortunately in this case it that whole spy thing hinges on what it is for us so without it being related we wouldn't have been talking about this film no that's true and actually Another element of, I guess, the spy element of the film that did, that fell a little short for me was the character of Valia. Mm. I think like Jean Kent is really fun. She has that kind of noirish, enigmatic kind of personality and look. She nails that, like Lauren Bacall's type of thing, like it's moody and yeah. yeah. But it feels like she's really underserved in the movie. Other people get way more to do than her, and it does feel like the two female characters are kind of shuttled off a little bit well they have this thing i i I asked my wife about this and she was none the wiser either And she watches a lot of like period dramas so i thought she would be the one to know but both of these two women are unmarried Mm -hmm. and so they're put in a cabin together yes like they can't be with the men if they're not married to each other well i mean i don't know anything about train travel in those days but like you had all those boarding houses for women where women would go to live and gentlemen weren't allowed on the premises. So, like, I guess it extends this to is, this is Cam like... speaking from being locked outside and, uh, <laughs> let me in! Yeah. Yeah. So, like, that was a thing in the old days. So, maybe that extends to train travel as well? 
just feels such a weird thing to police. I don't know. I mean, the morality police are <laughs> alive and well, Scott. Uh, that that is very true. That is very true. Um, something else you didn't like? Well, it's just like I would have liked to have seen more of those two women's dynamic because sure. it does feel like at a certain point that the Valia character is actually struggling with setting up Joan for the murder. Like she's talking about how the only reason she's involved in the spy craft is because she saw her father die. Mm-hmm. Once this diary stuff's dealt with, she's done. She's healed yeah. and perhaps ready to move on with her life and find love and all that. And there's a part where she talks about how like she feels really bad for Joan and Joan's been crying over this, you know, affair situation and she really empathizes with her as a person, but it's all her speaking about this information to Zerta, her accomplice. I would have liked a couple scenes with the two of them because the movie's got more than enough time to spend even with a dude talking to a chef about cod, like give me a scene or two of the two women talking to each other just to kind of flesh out that world. Yeah, what's going on in that cabin with the two of them? Mm-hmm. Like, what are they confessing to each other? I, I, I just found that, the, the fact that they're shoved into the room together very strange. But then I suppose from a, a filmmaking perspective, if, if you're going to do that, that's where you're like, where you can actually share some of the stories where those two tra- characters are talking to each other. But they, I don't think you ever really see in that room. If anything, you spend more time in the room with the two girls that are going hat shopping. Sure, yeah, yeah they have kind of a bigger role in a way too Mm. um and also there's a scene towards the end of the movie where they bring in uh valia as a witness to testify basically that uh joan was not at the site of the murder because Mm -hmm. the detectives kind of shifts the the blame potentially to joan uh in terms of the death of pool and so they call in valia because she can confirm that joan was in the room at the time of the murder and she throws her under the bus and says, nope, she left at 1230 as opposed to one, mm-hmm. thus making her a uh, continued suspect. That would have so much more of an emotional punch if we'd seen the two of them together throughout the movie. If there was a bond that was broken. Yeah. 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 You're not wrong. I wonder if that was one of those things they would have liked to have done, but just you had to keep it to 90 minutes. Or maybe it was like a whole boys club thing because it was in the 40s. Could be. Yeah. And I also think like the fact that Joan at the end goes back to Paris and doesn't continue the affair, mm. you could have had that realization, that sort of growing realization happen in scenes between the two of them. Like a, a, a regret slowly coming over her. Yeah, because there's yeah. nothing that really sets up her leaving George. No, it's very left field. If anything, they seem quite happy at the end when he's exonerated on you know, from, from being a murderer. So yeah, that does feel slightly left field. Yeah. Um. I, I. In terms of other dislikes I had, it was silly little things, but I. I felt it. It was very staged at times. Like it was like one or two sets. It. it this could have been a stage play. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, it does. Um. It's not big budget by any stretch of the imagination. Yeah, I mean it's interesting that it uh, was written. The original version was written by someone who was known for Broadway stage plays. Mm, yeah, that's true. I mean, I, I, sh- I shouldn't really be knocking it for not having enough money. It's not the film's fault it didn't have a big budget. Uh, and they used that money to pay some interesting actors to play some interesting roles. So I suppose I can't complain. Yeah. It's a movie that, like, in some ways it's hard to knock because it really does kind of work like clockwork. All the pieces are set up and they all kind of pay off by the end. So in terms of, like, a structure and plotting and the characters, it works. It's just that, like... When you get to the end of it, it's like you said up front. It's charming. It is confusing at times, but it's charming. It's kind of airy and enjoyable. But I, it feels like it's kind of lacking that kind of impact where you're just like, oh my God, have you seen Sleeping Car to Trieste? You've got to watch it. Yeah, it, it's missing whatever that magic was that for a sort of a contemporary film that we were knocked back for, which was Five Fingers. Mm, yeah. Like, I think... Five Fingers is also a very charming film, but there's something to do with that. Maybe it's James Mason's performance. Maybe it's the plot that I think really just sort of bowled us over. And we and made the knock list. It was that good. This, I think, is missing a, a, a little bit of that magic. Well, I think also you had like Joseph L. Mankiewicz directing that film, who was one of the great directors of his time. And uh, I didn't have any great issue with the direction by, you know, John Patty Carstairs. But... 
I would say it's more workmanlike than uh, you know, fully inspired. For sure. For sure. That I, I want to just throw to sort of like final notes we had. I had a few sort of questions left over. Yes. Uh what have you got, Cam? Um, so there was a line that um I thought was interesting about how uh the Brits prefer reputation over romance. Is that true, Scott? Uh thoroughly true. <laughs> Uh, I I've forsaken all romance in my life. Mm, okay. There was also the line, um, "Women are emotional, not Englishmen." <laughs> <laughs> you could tell this was a British film, but but yeah, yeah. Um, I, I from the forties, yes, <laughs> from from the forties. Yeah, I, I I'm not quite sure that holds up now. Okay, fair enough. Um, Sorry to disappoint you, Cam. I did have another question too. This is an ensemble film. We got a whole large group of characters. On this train, Scott, which character are you? Oh, I had a similar question, actually, but I, I, I think I'll add uh, my question on to the end. Which character am I? I think I'm the ornithologist. Okay. Now, are you talking about birds? I'm quite nerdy. And never leaving the cabin? Yeah. Like, I, 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 I don't want to share a toilet with people. I'm just going to stay here and just sort of nest for uh, much like a bird uh, for a day or so. Are you intrigued by the platypus? I I know it happens to be the only animal that lays an egg. It's actually not. <laughs> oh. <laughs> there is another one, actually. Uh, I don't remember. It's some obscure animal with a name I didn't recognize, but apparently there is another one. Uh, well, you can add that to the Wikipedia trivia. There you go. Um, so are you like tossing out bird trivia, or is it some other kind of trivia? It'll be, some, it'll be something else. It'll be something like... Uh... Star Trek? <laughs> yeah, probably. Okay. Yeah, what's like the duck bill platypus uh, equivalent of, of Trek trivia? Star Trek Enterprise trivia? <laughs> I don't know. Sure, yeah. Uh, people really won't care at that point. Yeah, I think I'd be, uh, I, I think I'd be that guy. Who, who do you think you'd be? I was thinking maybe I was the ornithologist. Uh, it would just wow. be movie trivia. Um, but We're both giant geeks, apparently. I'm trying to think of like, I, I, okay, I'm definitely not the David Tomlinson character. Uh, I would not say I am the Boner Coliano <laughs> Sergeant West character. Boner. Um, hmm. I don't think I'd be the guy talking about cod. You might be the exas- uh, exasperated chef having to deal with all my stuff. Or am I Mills? The assistant uh, to the annoying yeah. writer. Right. I think I'm Mills. I think you're Mills. Are you saying at some point you're going to try and get revenge on me? That is true to form i think for me to come up with a revenge scheme that seems foolproof that gets completely thwarted (laughs) you often do you often do yeah that's true yeah that's true okay yeah your mills i'm the ornithologist uh i i had a question that like bounces off of that Uh, great in a way who would you because this film obviously is obsessed with people sharing cabins and being stuck in situations and forced to have conversations with people they wouldn't usually have Instead of picking the character that you are, which of those characters would you most want to share a cabin with? Okay. Um, I don't know that I would mind sharing a cabin with David Tomlinson's character. I think it would actually lead to like kind of an entertaining trip. And it's not mm-hmm. like he's doing anything that's like skeezy or weird. It's like he just wants to like it's play poker cheerful. and to yeah, time. have fun yeah. and kind of make the journey something that's interesting and fun yeah like i don't i think that would be the character i'd probably want to hang out with that's a good choice it's probably my second choice i think i'm going to go for the gi because i think it would just be funny i think that would get unbearable at a certain point the root and tootinest gi in the world i i don't know i just think it'd be something to observe for how long is that engaging though like i think this character you give me about 10 minutes and i'm like okay that's enough yeah, but he like at least the GI went to bed. Like he gets bored and goes to sleep. Your guy's up all night playing poker and drinking vodka. Yeah, that's true. Like, do you want to stay up all night, Cam? You're not a not a night owl. I am a night owl, but oh, you are. Yeah, I'm not. Yeah, I have more of a line. Like I'll stay up till like two a.m. or something like that. But Party when on. you start pushing me to all nights, I don't know about that. No, I I think I think I'd struggle with uh, Thomas and sort of energy. Yeah, it would depend. I think if I found him annoying, it would great. But if I enjoyed his energy, then it would actually kind of keep me awake and I would want to stay up. Sure. 
Uh, the only other note I had left was for uh, funny names for sequels. So I, I had a few. Okay. I've got uh, Pedlo to Piccadilly. <laughs> and uh, Apple Cart to Ankara. Okay. Uh, that, that's the only two I wrote down, but like, I just want to see if you come up with anything. Hand car to Holland? Sh- sure. I, I don't, the film doesn't use like, alliteration. I don't know why we are in these, but it, it <laughs> seems to work. Should they have used alliteration? What would you call it? Train to Trieste. Uh, sleeping car to Salzburg? I don't know. Oh, you changed the location, not not the actual... Okay, yeah. Sleeping car to... I, I think you want an SL word, though. Yeah. Like a, a place that starts with SL. Mm. Uh, well, we're spiraling here, but I, I, I still want to watch... Um, <laughs> I, I, I want to watch Pedalo to Piccadilly, I will say. That is the most British-sounding movie I've ever heard of. <laughs> it certainly is. Do you know what a pedalo is? No. <laughs> oh, okay. <clears throat> I'm sure you've seen a pedalo before, but you know, like on like small bodies of water, like lakes and and stuff, at, 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 like parks, they have those like swans that you can pedal around. Yeah. Okay. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That we call them pedalos. Okay. Okay. What do you call them? Duck bikes. Paddle wheeler? Paddle wheeler. Or is it paddle? Not paddle wheeler. Paddle wheeler is like the large boats. Paddle boat. Yeah. I prefer peddler. Sounds so cool. Your uh, film title there. Th- what is it again? Say it, the P one? Pedalo to Piccadilly. It reminds me of that Simpsons movie, the fake movie of, was it the Fab Trapulous Contraption, Professor Pro- Horatio Huffnagel or whatever it was. <laughs> is, that, is that meant to be like the most British sounding film they can come up with? Or just like this, like obnoxiously titled, kind of wacky nineteen fifties uh, kind of movie. Yeah, sure. I I I think Pedal Out to Piccadilly is the sequel we never got. Uh, I'm not sure how you can have a whole cavalcade of people on a pedalo, but we'd figure that out as screenwriters can. We'd figure that out. Well, I'm down for that one. Maybe, maybe here's the plot. Mm. They're all out on pedalos on this lake. And then, like, the jetty where they park it collapses. Ooh. And so they can't get off. They have to stay on the pedalos and form an, a community. Okay. And then you find out one's a murderer. Right. And then one of the other ones happens to have a very good detective inspector on the pedalo, and he vows to solve the crime before they're rescued. <laughs> uh, Sold. Yeah, great story, everyone. Uh, I, I, it's not a spy story. I, I can hear the bidding war now. Oh, yeah. Yeah, uh, Tubi, he'll be all over it. Yeah. <laughs> Tubi original. Yeah. <laughs> What's the one that who, like, did 15-minute shorts that closed down already? Oh, uh, oh, damn it. Um, I'm totally blanking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is it, is it uh, Quibi? It is. It's Quibi, yes. Yeah, it'd be a Quibi original. Or, or is it Yahoo movie? No, is it Yahoo TV they did or something like that? Lasted like a year? Google Screen? Sure, Google Screen exclusive. <laughs> yeah, great. YouTube Red. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Coming to YouTube Red, Pedalo to Piccadilly. Yeah. Great, great, great. Um, any other notes from you, Cam? Uh, I don't think so, no. I think that kind of sums up my uh, my notes on this one. All right, well, uh, let's uh, pull into the station. We've arrived at Trieste, but is it making the knock list? I think we've uh, maybe signposted this one, but Cam, I'll throw it to you. What do you think? It's a no for me. This is like a charming, fun movie that I think people would enjoy watching. Um, But when we talk about spy films, they typically have a stronger undercurrent of espionage and spycraft or tradecraft. Um this movie is more like kind of a fun whodunit that just so happens to have a little bit of spy influence going on. It's kind of like the uh, trench coat thing where it's mostly a different plot, but there is spy stuff like at some point. Yeah, like you swap out the two spies with two jewel thieves and instead of the diary have some jewels, uh, it's like the same movie. Yeah, because the murder still happens and the murder has to be investigated and the guy still jumps out of the train with the jewels and still gets hit. Yeah, you would have to change a little bit of the author character discovering the diary, sure. but you would have to kind of rewrite that a little bit to justify his response to the jewelry. But... You just have Mills reading an article from the magazine saying, oh, jewels stolen, famous jewels stolen from Embassy. 
with a photo that shows the photo and then he finds it. Yeah. yeah. That's it. That's all you have to do. So look at me. I'm writing a screenplay. Uh, well, that's a no from you then. Yeah. Yeah. It's a no from me. I'm uh, same boat. It's a no from me. I think it's a perfectly enjoyable film. I use the word charming. I stick by the word charming. It's got a lot going for it. I think it's a fun, like who done it situational sort of story. There's a lot of tension to it. There's some great characters, some very memorable characters. I said one of my notes was, if you ask me about Sleeping Card to Trieste in five years' time, I won't be able to tell you about any of the plot. Yeah, but I will remember like Duckbill Platypus Guy and the GI. And I think the uh, political writer as well. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So, yeah, no from me, but if you have the spare time, click on the link below in the show notes, check it out on YouTube. It's yeah. I don't think you'll be disappointed with your 90 minutes. I'd agree with that, yeah. Yeah, it's just not an all-time spy film. We've had pretty good luck with uh, these kind of older YouTube ones. Like, we haven't had a lot of, like, home-run knocklist movies, but we haven't really stumbled across one yet that was just like, oh, this was wretched to sit through. One of, the, like, the British agent or special agent or secret agent, <laughs> one of those ones was, was pretty rough. The one that was set in, like, Russia. British agent. Yeah, that was a bit tough to get through. That I mean, I would say that's on the low end, but it was still pretty watchable for me. Like, we have not had the one that was just like sitting and watching a garbage fire for 90 minutes. Sure. And it's also interesting, like, we haven't disavowed a film in, like, a very long time. Yeah. Yeah. And that's not because we don't think about it. It's because it's not been anything that egregious. Yeah. No, that's true. I mean, uh, I've seen the upcoming slate, and uh, stay tuned, folks. You never know. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> oh okay i try and stay away from it so uh, right we'll find out then but there you go folks two no's and as such sleeping car two trias is not making the knock list the dossier on the film is complete and filed as classified cam a question goes to you good sir where is our next destination scott it's been a while since we've talked about mr jason bourne Perhaps that's because we covered all the movies, which would make sense as to why we haven't tackled him recently. But you know what? There is a movie that we neglected, a movie that we forgot about along our journey, and that is 1988's The Bourne Identity, starring Richard Chamberlain, which began life as a miniseries, was later edited together into a DVD film that was released. We're going to look at that film and determine how it stacks up against the very famous Matt Damon entries. Yes, we're kind of breaking from one of our earlier rules. We said only films that had cinematic releases. This hasn't. But because Jason Bourne and The Bourne Identity is such an important story in the sort of spy canon, we think taking a look at the TV movie that inspired it is very important. And that might open the door to a few more very popular TV movies, hint, hint, in the future that you may just see on the podcast. Uh, And also, This TV movie in both halves is readily available on YouTube. Uh, We may try and put it up on our channel. And if not, there will be links in the show notes next week's episode to get to watch it. Or you could just, of course, search for The Born Identity 1988 on YouTube and you can watch the whole thing there. So don't think you're missing out. You can get it for free wherever you are in the world. And we are also accompanying this episode on The Born Identity with a very special Spy Master interview. We're talking with director Roger Young, who brought both episodes to the small screen, and he's worked on a bunch of other stuff, including you know, Law and Order. He's worked on the Rome TV series. Alfred Hitchcock presents lots of stuff, but we're focusing on The Born Identity, and he has never spoken about this in an interview before, about how this came to him working with Richard Chamberlain and the rest of the cast to bring this beloved spy novel to the small screen. But your mission, should you choose to accept it, is to join us next week as we take a look at 1988's adaptation of the Robert Ludlum novel, The Born Identity. And if you like what you heard on the show this week, please consider leaving us a five-star review wherever you get your podcast. And do not forget to follow us discreetly on social media at SpyHards, that's S-P-Y-H-A-R-D-S on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. But until next week, listeners, did you know that the plural of a snipe is snipe?